More than five decades ago, this man began his hunt for the truth about UFOs. We were able to identify the crew. We had the name of the pilot, Pappy Henderson. And in the Roswell yearbook that Walter Hott had kept, uh, Pappy Henderson's name only appears one time, and it's with his flight crew. His name is Kevin Randall. And beginning as a kid, he has pursued a lifelong interest into the UFO phenomena, and he has spent nearly three decades just on the Roswell incident alone. As a result, he's rightfully earned his place as one of the top minds on the topic. Kevin is a retired Army Lieutenant Colonel. He served in Vietnam where he accumulated more than 1,100 hours of combat flight time. He deployed again to Iraq in 2003 as an intelligence officer, and he would later also serve with the United States Air Force. Today, Kevin joins me to discuss his decades worth of research, the fact that he has authored more than 80 books, and he will outline just some of his investigations of hundreds of cases and multiple facets to whatever this UFO phenomena is. Stay tuned. You're about to journey inside the Black Vault. That's right, everybody. As always, thank you so much for tuning in and taking this journey inside the Black Vault with me. I'm your host, John Greenwald Jr. And as you could probably tell, we're already having a good time because I feel like we're having a little bit of vuja day here, Kevin. Uh, uh, Kevin Randall joining me, by the way. This is the second time for those that aren't aware. Sadly, we had the technical glitch of all technical glitches last time, where for the first time ever, I had to say... I give up and I, uh, I had to, to cut the interview. And so I've worked uh, painstakingly since then to try and figure it out. So Kevin, thank you so much uh, for your patience and understanding and trying this again with me today. Oh, don't mind at all. I understand technical glitches. We have them all the time. Uh, yesterday on my program, as we were recording it, uh, we lost the audio on the guest twice. Oh, see that? Well, it's, there's, there's goblins out there that are trying to keep us all from chatting. Uh, I but once, once, once it was during the commercial break, so we didn't care and we got it fixed. Yeah. And the second time was right in the middle of the uh, segment, so we had to kind of manipulate that. Well, that's what's always fun with live is you have absolutely no idea what the heck is going to go wrong. And when, it was, and when it does go catastrophically wrong, there's absolutely no going <laughs> back. I mean, you just have to you know grin and bear it and that's it. Uh, but the good news is, is I'll be chopping up the video that we did record. We may repeat a little bit today uh, for those that, that may have joined us for both, uh, but that's just to have a full show for those that are downloading on the podcast version. Uh, Kevin, what I told you last time, and I want to tell you again, and it's hard for me to say this, one of the most fun radio shows to be on is yours. And I uh, really, uh, to be honest with you, I, I don't say that a lot, but I think the most uh, the most fun that we have is actually in between the breaks. And so that that I, I must say is kind of a fun position for me to be in because now I get to interview you. Let me kind of start a little bit with your background and kind of take you back to how you got into this. So obviously you have a long career researching ufos which is obviously what you're known for but you're a very established author the introduction actually said 80 books but i'll correct myself it's it's over 120 is that right uh more than 120 yeah somewhere around 125 130 somewhere in there i just don't count anymore that's incredible and my sincere compliments to you i mean literally not a, to do a shameless plug coming out with a second book that i've done here in the last two years and that was a pain. Like, I, I mean, I'll be honest, the, <laughs> it was very, very difficult and challenging for me. So my sincere compliments and kudos to you for, for more than 120 books. How did you get into that? The writing books? Yeah. When did you start I, and how'd you get into it? I was always interested in writing. I remember in, in uh, what is now called middle school, junior high school, 
we had a, a student newspaper and I wanted to get into that and be a journalist. I wasn't sure what a journalist did, just wanted to get into that. So I was involved in the, uh, in, in the newspaper and it kind of grew out of that. In high school, of course, I was on the, the uh, staff of the high school newspaper and that sort of thing. But I always been interested in writing and sharing stories like that. Um, in, while well, I was still in the army, a friend of mine, Fred Becker, and I were writing science fiction stories. We didn't manage to get anything published but we were writing science fiction stories and I was and I did a couple of UFO stories and one of the UFO stories I, I started when I was in the army I'd sent off to Saga which uh, was a men's magazine not like Playboy or Penthouse but it dealt with men's stories uh, World War II stories exposés that sort of thing that not the pictures of the naked women <laughs> But they were into, they, but they did UFO things, and I did an article for them on UFOs while I was still in the Army, got out of the Army, entered the um, University of Iowa, and got a letter from them and said, well, we kind of like your story, but you've got too much stuff in here that, that has been published before. Can you come up with some new stuff? So I took out all the old stuff and made reference to it like in a line or two and then moved on and sent that in and they said well you know this is this is great but you need to uh, you need to explain explain expand on the stuff that you just touched on so I put all the stuff back in that I'd taken out and they finally bought the uh, article which was helpful because it nearly paid the first semester's tuition for, my, for the, yeah. at the University of Iowa but that that kind of launched into the writing of the UFO stuff because I'd found an outlet that paid in an outlet that would buy the stories and the science fiction wasn't going that well. Met a guy in uh, ROTC, Air Force ROTC, uh, Bob Cornett, Robert Charles Cornett. We called him RC Squared. And he and I developed a, um, well, we both had an interest in science fiction. And so we started writing science fiction stories. And what we did was we'd go to the science fiction conventions because editors attend those, editors who buy books attend those. So we would meet the editors and they would uh, know who we were might look a little more favorably on on the over the transom manuscripts but what happened was we met a an agent there and she signed us up and then she was uh, working to get us some writing and she, she called me one day and she said can you write books about green berets in Vietnam because she knew I was a Vietnam veteran and I'm thinking to myself yeah and if you asked me if I could write books about nurses and hospitals the answer would have been yes yeah because here's an opportunity to write books because she had somebody interested in this. So Bob and I put together a uh, proposal, you know, uh, just a, an outline of one of the books and the list of the characters and that sort of thing that we wanted to cover. And she sold a series of books that way for us, knowing that we wanted to write science fiction. And eventually we were able to sell a, a book. We called it Seeds of Doubt originally, but the publisher stupidly changed the name to Seeds of War. Hmm. We didn't, we didn't care. And it, had it happened in today's environment, I would have argued for the original title because the original title had an actual purpose. Yeah. But um, they bought that and they said we'd like two others. So it became a short series. And so that got us into the science fiction. But I was still writing the, the UFO articles, especially through the 70s when they had, the, uh, they had a lot of UFO magazines. You, you may or may not remember. Mm -hmm. UFO Report, uh, Saga's. Uh, Saga's UFO report, Argosy's UFOs, uh, True's UFOs and Flying Saucers, official UFOs. There's like six magazines that dealt with this, and I was writing for all of them and making a pretty good living at that. But that whole thing went bust at the end of the 70s. And so, you know, but at that point, we were moving into this doing science fiction. And I got the idea to take those magazine articles and expand them into a book. And so, um, the agent sold that book as well, and from that point on, we got in got into the uh, the UFO stuff. Don Don Schmidt was going to be at a science fiction convention in Milwaukee. I think I think XCon. All the all the science fiction conventions end in con. Like mm -hmm. XCon is there. Well, Icon was in was in Iowa City. Um, Windy Con was obviously in Chicago. Mini Con was obviously in Minneapolis. Anyway. Um, he, he showed up there, and he and another guy from CUFAS were going to debate three science fiction writers about UFOs. The science fiction writers were going to be Frederick Pohl. The name that everybody knows now is George R.R. R. Martin. Mm -hmm. I believe that was him, and me. Well, it happened that Don showed up alone. And I thought, well, this is a debate, and I can argue either side. It doesn't matter to me. So I switched sides. And so it was Don Schmidt and me against George R.R. R. Martin and Frederick Pohl. And Don asked me afterwards, he said, uh, 
he, he contacted me afterwards and said they were going to be investigating the Roswell case. And there were a lot of military witnesses they were going to be interviewing. And he wanted to know if I would like to go along because he thought my military background would at least open some of the doors. So I said, sure. So that was how we got into the Roswell case. And from there, the UFO thing kind of exploded. And I was getting requests to write UFO books mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. And when they're, when they're saying, yeah, write a, science, write, a, write a UFO book for us, I'm thinking, yeah, I could do that. Yeah. So, <laughs> well, let me ask you, but before we get into your work on the Roswell incident, when you were writing about UFOs, was this because of a personal interest or was this because you wanted to be a writer and that's the story that you were tasked to do? Oh, no, I was always interested in it. I My interest began prior to high school. Uh, my mother took me through the movie Earth versus the Flying Saucers mm -hmm. with my, my hero, uh, Hugh, Hugh Marlowe. Although our real hero is um, Kenneth Toby, who was in The Thing, but that's a whole other argument. Uh, but, but that kind of sparked my interest in UFO. So that kind of went on, and I was uh, uh, interested in that as well. So I was writing the UFO stuff as well as science fiction stuff at the same time. And it just happened that the magazines, uh, the UFO magazines were exploding and they needed a lot of material. That, that helped selling, selling uh, stuff. And so that was how I kind of transitioned into that. But when that went away, we transitioned back into the science fiction. So uh, it was, but it was always an interest of mine, mm -hmm. uh, UFOs was always, in fact, in high school, I had an opportunity to interview a friend of, a friend of mine's mother. She had, I think it was in South Dakota, North Dakota, South Dakota. And she'd had a UFO sighting. And the question I had for her was something in the 60s we didn't really know because you were getting all the stuff from the Air Force. Well, nobody sees anything great. It's always a blurry light in the distance. There's nothing uh, definitive about it. And that was my question for her. Did the object have sharp edges? Did you see it clearly? Hmm. And she said it was about 200 feet over the barn. And she got a very good look at it. It was very distinct. And she could see all the detail on it. And that was a question I wanted to ask have answered for my own personal mm -hmm. uh, interest but it, it all exploded out of out of probably going to see earth versus the flying saucers so we can blame my mother for this <laughs> well i'm uh, i'm glad she did that to you L let me i mean we we all know obviously the the rough overview of the roswell incident so so i won't make you recount every uh, detail of that but talking in a broad sense when you started tackling that how did you approach it? I mean, were you going in saying that this was impossible being an alien craft? Did you go in with that mindset? I mean, what was your original thought when you sat down and said, I'm going to go ahead and start writing about this and tackle this and figure out what's going on? We didn't really start to write anything about it. Uh, Don Schmidt had called me and asked for me to join his team. We kind of, you know, a, a team because of my military background, as I said. But we both thought, based on having read the original um, or knew about the original Aztec story that this thing was bogus because flying saucers just don't crash. It's, it's nonsense. We'll go down there. We'll solve it in a day or two and that'll be the end of this nonsense. I was aware of the Roswell incident when it came out in 1980 and I thought it was just the Aztec story repackaged for a different audience. Mm -hmm. We got down there. We, we went to Albuquerque. We're going to meet Frank Joyce who was a radio announcer at, um, at what KGFL. In, in Roswell, who had, who had interviewed Mac Brazel, got there and he was not, he was unavailable. He was ill. And I'm thinking, well, there's no surprise. We went to a meeting of a group in Albuquerque, a UFO group, and these really weren't, it wasn't really a UFO group, it was more a new age group, and they were way out there, and that was no help. And the next day we drove on down to Roswell, which seemed to take forever and a week, in an old beat up pickup truck that uh, our host in Albuquerque uh, had and drove us to. Uh, Roswell, going to meet Cliff Stone down there. Cliff Stone doesn't want us to come to his house. He's going to meet us at the Burger King, and he walks in in uniform, and I'm thinking, well, this guy's a yo-yo. <laughs> and um, his, his, you know, his name's in the telephone directory, so if we'd wanted to find his house, we'd have looked him up in the phone book. So mm -hmm. that meeting us in the Burger King was ridiculous. We got to his house. We're inside. He says, well, excuse me for a minute. He walks out, he comes back, and he's carrying a document with a top-secret cover sheet on it. And having been an Air Force intelligence officer, I know that you store top secret material not in your car, not in your bedroom. You, it's, it's stored in a vault, mm -hmm. not a safe, in a vault. And uh, as an intelligence officer in, in uh, the Air Force, I had a safe for the, the secret material. It had to weigh at least 600 pounds. It had to do this. It had to do that and, and all of that. But for top secret, you needed a vault. Hmm. And I'm thinking, well, this is just for show. Uh, we talked to him. 
he didn't tell us anything we didn't already know. Uh, the next day, which was a Sunday, we're going to meet Bill Brazel, son of the man that found the thing, in the Outpost Cafe in Carrizoso. We got there and sat down with him, and he started telling us the story. He told us later, he said, well, I thought if I liked you guys, I'd help you out, and if I didn't, I'd just blow you off. Mm -hmm. And I had sent him a letter, because <laughs> in New Mexico, you can send a letter to Bill Brazel, care of, or he lived in um, Capitan, New Mexico, and so I sent a letter to Bill Brazel, Capitan, New Mexico. Didn't have an address, a street address or anything. It got to still him, got there. Wow. Yeah. Send a letter to a, a, a building in New York. They won't deliver it. Send a letter to Capitan, New Mexico. They deliver it. And he called me and we set up the meeting. I, I said, if you'd like to talk, uh, you know, give me a call. And he said he appreciated the fact that I didn't try to call him and set it up, that I'd send him the letter and let him initiate the contact. So he decided, yeah, well, I'll help you out. So he told us the story and told about how he had found some pieces of the debris and what they were like, told us about his dad finding the thing and what had happened with his dad. And uh, it turned the whole, the whole thing around. I'm thinking there's a lot more to this story. So as we're going back to Albuquerque to catch our flight, I said to Don, you know, we can do, we can do more. We, there's more to be done here. We've got to do more. And we came back just weeks later, uh, met with Bill Brazel again. Love this. It's 8 o'clock in the morning. We meet him at... Uh, a little cafe in Capitan, just the meeting place. He's in his pickup truck, so he's going to drive us out to the debris field where he found the stuff. So we're driving along. It's 8 o'clock in the morning, and he says, you boys want a beer? <laughs> and I'm thinking, no, not really. And uh, Don says, no, he's a tilt holder, and Bill Brazel's now drinking a beer. And I'm thinking, one of us has got to drink with this guy. <laughs> 8 o'clock in the morning, I'm drinking a warm bill with Bill Bill Brazel yep. driving across New Mexico deserts. But he took us to the place where he'd found the stuff. I got two pictures of him and Don Schmidt standing on the debris field. Wow. People have said, well, you don't know where it is. I'm thinking, how about a picture of Bill Brazel standing there pointing to the ground and says, yeah, this is where I found some of the stuff. <laughs> Isn't that good enough for you? Yeah. <laughs> But after we talked to him, and we, Frank Joyce was then available. He'd been sick the time before we got his story. We met a guy named Ralph Hike, who said, would you like to meet the uh, uh, daughters of the sheriff, Sheriff Wilcox? We said, yeah, of course. Mm -hmm. Got to meet the daughters, which eventually led to other things. Talked to some other people, got a lot of additional information. And as we're going back to the airport this time, I said, Don, you know, we can do a book on this. And so that was the outgrowth of the investigation. But it wasn't just to do the book. It was to, well, it was actually to share the information with a, a lot of people. And it was a way to recoup some of our expenses. Mm -hmm. I know Walt Andrus at MUFON was very distressed at the amount of money we were spending. And he wondered why he wasn't getting that money. He wondered who was financing us. And, of course, it was us financing mm -hmm. us. And we weren't going to donate the money to move on. We were going to use it for our investigation. So we recouped some of the money by writing the book. I, the first book was, I think, premature. Mm -hmm. um, we thought we had the story down pretty close. and But as we got deeper and deeper into it over the as the years passed, we, we found out that some of the people were less than candid with us. Um, and then more people people showed up uh, claiming to have some kind of knowledge of what had happened and that sort of thing. So, uh, can, can I ask how that, that kind of morphed for, uh, for you? Meaning like, what was, what was, what was your thought process and kind of conclusion per se in the first books versus how did that, uh, uh, what did it morph into? Well, in the first book uh, and in the second book, I was absolutely convinced something crashed. I mean, a UFO crash, flying saucer crash, an alien spacecraft crash. And it was no doubt in my mind. It was based on some of the testimony we had. Frank Joyce, for example, claimed that he had been part of an elite team that helped pick up part of this stuff. And he had some documentation to support that. And that was very persuasive. We found out later that the documentation was fraudulent. He'd, he'd invented it himself. After he had passed away, Don Schmidt, uh, Mark Rodiger, who was the scientific director at the science at the UFO Center, Center for UFO Studies, and Mark Chesney had visited with um, Frank Kaufman's widow, and she asked them to go through his office to see if there were any contracts or anything that he had not fulfilled in relation to his appearances on TV programs and that sort of thing. They found his original discharge papers from the Army compared to what he'd given us. Mm -hmm. And we found that he had he'd, uh, taken, he'd said that he had he'd gotten out of the Army as a Master Sergeant. Untrue. Gotten out as a Staff Sergeant. Um, not a big embellishment, but an embellishment nonetheless. He um, said he'd been trained in intelligence. Nothing in his official 
papers, the ones he got from the, that, that they found in his office said anything about that. He was all involved in administration. Mm-hmm. An important function in the military, because contrary to what Napoleon said, the army does not move on its stomach. It moves on its paperwork. Mm-hmm. But it was there was nothing. I mean, there were there were things like that. And we, we found out other things that he told us wasn't quite true. And so um, Mark Rodiker and I did an article for the International UFO Reporter sometime after 2000, 2001, sometime in that time frame after we got all this information and kind of exposed that. And, and that that was very worrisome. Uh, and we found other th- other things like that. Uh, Loretta Proctor, a very nice woman, uh, a neighbor of Mac Brazel, but we could see how some of the information she was giving to us had been picked up later on. I mean, she, she was became a contaminated source. Mm-hmm. Didn't mean the original story that she talked about with uh, Mac coming to visit her and her husband wasn't true, or that he, and that he showed him a piece of the debris and that sort of thing. It was just some of the descriptions she provided. Um, became a little bit contaminated and, and and you have to understand i mean when you have multiple people talking about this and then you have multiple sources i mean how many documentaries have you seen about roswell yeah and so you pick up these things and and and, and it becomes clear to you that, that this is what you saw i think elizabeth loft lofton did uh loftus did some work on that um one of them was called Lost in the Mall, where they implanted a memory in a young child about being lost in the mall and all they did was the parents agreed to this experiment and they just said do you remember the time you were lost in the mall and pretty soon he had a very robust story about it and and the kicker was he'd never been lost in the mall it was just the suggestion so you have to be careful when you're talking Mm -hmm. to people something that i learned after we began our investigation that sort of thing but as we got on we found more witnesses that were had come forward who were not telling the truth who were just plugging themselves in the story um Edwin Easley, the provost marshal, on the other hand, wouldn't tell me a whole lot. And I think I'm the only one that ever interviewed him. The provost marshal being like the chief of police mm-hmm. the, on the base. In fact, in, I, I retired from the Iowa National Guard in the provost marshal's office. I became one of those guys. But um, when I talked to him, he would tell me, well, I can't talk to you. I was sworn to secrecy. And he wouldn't tell us much about what had transpired but he would he would tell us what he thought he could tell us without violating the oath he'd taken Mm -hmm. about being being quiet about it one of the things he said for example mac brazel hadn't been held in the stockade on the post or the air air base he'd been held in the guest house well if you're locked into the guest house room or there's a guard on your door it's the next best thing to being in jail and he would and mac brazel was quite angry about that and we talked to several neighbors who remembered mac brazel complaining about it bill brazel said that when he read about his father in the newspaper, Albuquerque Journal. I think Albuquerque Journal, Albuquerque Tribune both had stories about it. Mm-hmm. He said his dad was going to need help at the ranch, so he went down to the ranch and helped. When he got there, his dad wasn't there, and he didn't show up for two or three days. So we know his, his father had been dis- So So we could corroborate some of the story that way. So yeah. we had some very good, robust pieces. But then we got into these things where people were just coming out of the woodwork, telling us stories that just didn't make any sense. And we were trying to get all that done i finally did a book two or three years ago called roswell in the 21st century where i looked at it as a cold case now looking at our investigation 20 years earlier and what Mm -hmm. we had done and looking at all the information and how it had changed and where i had been willing to say almost unconditionally that a flying saucer had crashed in today's environment i say we don't have that last little bit of proof. Mm -hmm. I got some interesting stories from some very credible people. uh, And I, and I should go back for a moment for Edwin Easley. I had asked him at one point if we were following the right path. And he said, what do you mean? And I said, we think it was extraterrestrial. And he said, well, let me put it this way. It's not the, it's not the wrong path. In essence, telling us that from Easley's point of view, it was the right path. And, And every member of Colonel Blanchard's staff that we were able to interview said the same thing with one exception, that it was, something something extraordinary not a project mogul balloon or any of the nonsense we have found no terrestrial explanation to explain it does that get you to the extraterrestrial for some people that yeah i got given and and other people i need something a little bit more and i can understand that so when i did Roswell in the 21st century i looked at all of this stuff again and some of the witnesses that we'd found fairly robust we no longer trusted glenn dennis is another fine example i said i shouldn't say we don't trust i don't trust anymore glenn Mm -hmm. dennis turned out to uh he was the mortician mortician yes mortician talked and, and talked about his nurse said to me 
privately. I'll give you the name. Don't tell anybody. Okay, I can I can keep a secret. I know how to do that. I was trained in intelligence. Mm-hmm. Um, next thing I know, Phil Class has the name, <laughs> and and uh, Glenn Dennis had given it to Carl Flock, and I think Carl Flock gave it to Phil Class. Anyhow, the name was out. Uh, Naomi Self is the name he gave us. A guy named Vic Golubic, who you may have may know or may have heard of, decided he was going to find the nurse. Mm-hmm. He had the name. He went through like 125,000 records that the Army had of nurses or the names of nurses that they had served in the Army over a period of 50 years or whatever. Mm-hmm. Couldn't find the name. Thought, well, maybe she was assigned to the, um, a, a civilian nurse assigned to the, the local hospital, and they worked together periodically. So maybe Glenn Dennis was mistaken that she'd been an Army nurse, although she, he told us that she had been transferred out of Roswell soon after this happened and been killed in an airplane crash that killed five nurses. Mm-hmm. Um, Don Berliner and I, and I know you know Don Berliner, mm-hmm. Uh, he went through the Stars and Stripes, which is a newspaper published overseas for the military personnel. I enjoyed the Stars and Stripes when I was in Iraq because it had Calvin and Hobbes being reprinted in that. <laughs> got to gotta, gotta love gotta, Calvin and Hobbes. Yeah. Um, I went through the New York Times Index. This was back in the days when we didn't have access to all this computer information. I had to go down to the University of Iowa Library, and, of course, the New York Times published an in- index, and you could look up airplane accidents. So I went through all the indexes for all the airplane accidents, military airplane accidents from 1947 to 1955. Couldn't find one that killed five nurses. Don Berliner found nothing about the nurses being killed in the Stars and Stripes. So there's another strike against him. Mm -hmm. Vic Golubic, I had tried to get the morning reports and the Army, I don't know, I'm sure they still do it in some fashion, but it used to be a, a document they filled out every morning. It, it, it told you how many soldiers were available for duty, how many were in the hospital, by name who was in the hospital, how many were on leave, by name who was on leave, who joined the unit, who'd signed out of the unit. So if you have like uh, 250 people, you might have five or six names on the morning report, uh, in sick in the hospital or on temporary duty or have transferred out, whatever. And... Uh, when I tried to get that stuff from St. Louis, they sent me the headquarters company stuff, which was not helpful. Vic, ma- Vic managed to get it for the um, hospital, Squadron M, mm-hmm. from from uh, the beginning of 1947 through the end of 1948, I think. It was. Her name never surfaced in that. Hmm. Uh, he, he never found her name. So he finally went to Glenn Dennis and he said, we couldn't find the name. It's not the nurse. And he said, well, you guys were pressing me for a name. So I, I told you at the time I'd give you a name, but it wouldn't be the right name. Oh, wow. And then he, and then he changed the name. And I, and I said, at that point, I don't believe a word he says anymore yeah. because that, that was him trying to alibi it. it yeah. He didn't, didn't say to me, I'll give you the wrong name. Cause if you give me the wrong name, I wouldn't have cared. Yeah, exactly. I would, I spent money with a police officer. We, we did a number of searches through various databases. I think it cost us like $200 to do it working with the police officer didn't find anything about her we found uh four women named naomi self none of them were the right ones so uh at that point glenn dennis blows up on us so the story of the story that he tells being involved isn't true which does not necessarily negate the story about the call to to the mortician for the coffins Mm -hmm. what we think happened was glenn dennis began telling that story after the guy who actually got the call had died so he had he knew the story from the guy who'd actually gotten the phone call Hmm. and so the story the story has a little bit of truth in it but it's not glenn dennis's truth so looking at all of that stuff yeah when i put together roswell in the 21st century i looked at all of that with a very skeptical eye and i got to the point where i said well you know we can't find any rockets or missiles launched from White Sands that would account for this. The Air Force couldn't find any aircraft accidents that would account for this. And, and they looked, and I mean, thank the Air Force for doing that. Thank mm-hmm. you, Air Force. Um, we checked everything we could think of. We had weather records for the whole time, um, winds aloft data, for example. We, we checked everything that we could find that might possibly explain what was found. Uh, we'd actually come up with the mogul explanation for the air, before the Air Force did and rejected it because um, flight number four never flew. So you, you look at all that, we don't have a terrestrial explanation. So, but, we, 
but I don't have I don't have the the, the the last little bit of evidence to move it into the extraterrestrial. And so the, the conclusion conclusion in the book is um, here is the best evidence, best information about Roswell as it exists today. Mm-hmm. Don't pay attention to some of the earlier stuff because it's contaminated by witnesses that we believed at one time and and didn't tell us the truth. Let me t- like omit a few of those witnesses. Then we'll move on from Roswell because I don't want to do the whole thing. There's a couple things I want to ask you about. But when you talk to some of the original firsthand people that were there, you know, with from Mac Brazel, I assume Marcel that that was on your list, although I don't think you mentioned him yet. When you deal with those people that literally were were there, is that what what kind of keeps you saying there's something to this story? Because it sounds like you 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 have a lot of witnesses that were just making stuff up with you, and so you start discounting those and and for obvious reasons. But what keeps you saying we don't have an explanation, but there's something here. There's something to this. Edwin Easley, for example. Uh, who is on Blanchard's staff, and I mentioned him. Um, Patrick Saunders, who's the base adjutant, and I have documentation letters from him and from his family members talking about how they'd managed to cover up everything, meaning uh, in the military, if you do something, you have to pay for it. Some, it has to come out of some pot of money. And for example, in the, in the military aviation units, uh, flying time has to be accounted for. Is it training? Is it moving something around? It, what, what, why are you making that mission? So if I want to move an alien craft or the bodies from that craft from Roswell to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, Wright Field in Dayton, Ohio, what do I do? Training mission, nav- overnight navigation mission. And so the, the, the flight is now paid for. There's no saying, well, we flew bodies and alien wreckage to mm-hmm. Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. You've covered it that way. And Patrick Saunders, in one of the documents I have, said, you know, we did a wonderful job of hiding the money. So you try to trace the money and you come back to legitimate military explanation. So Patrick Saunders, I talked to him twice, I think. Once uh, he had just gotten out of the hospital and I was stunned because I – you know, the guy is the guy was like 117 years old <laughs> and uh, he was just out of the hospital and I didn't want to spend a lot of his time. And I called him back later and we talked a little bit about that. He made fun of the little the, the little bodies. But what he did was he had copies of both the uh, UFO crash at Roswell and Truth About the UFO crash at Roswell. And he wrote on the flyleaf of, of the books notes and he and he on the flyleaf of one it was talking about how they'd cover everything up and all that and he said uh, you know this is the truth and i never told anybody any anything about it and he signed his name patrick saunders i mean credible guy mm-hmm. he retired as a full colonel unlike me who only retired as a credio lieutenant colonel <laughs> um but a very credible guy very close mouth what he'd seen um we, we talked to well the, the staff members briley talked about it easily talked about it um I didn't talk to Jesse Marcel Sr., but I've seen the, the video yeah. interviews. I even chased down a video interview that was done by Johnny Mann, who was a reporter for WWL Television in New Orleans. And he'd gone out because uh, Marcel's lived in Houma, Louisiana, which isn't all that far from mm-hmm. uh, New Orleans. And uh, they, they'd gone to Roswell and all of that stuff. So I saw the raw, I saw the footage of that interview that he'd, he'd made and cut for the program where Marcel said, you know, it was, it was something that, that didn't come from here. It came from somewhere else. Talked to Jesse Marcel many, many times. Talked to Walter Hott many times. Walter Hott, uh, I, the problem with Walter Hott, and, and I, I go over this in the book for literally decades, said the only thing he'd done was write the press release. He'd heard from, you know, Blanchard had told him to write the press release, told him what to put in it, that sort of thing. He wasn't sure whether Blanchard had dictated it to him or give him the, the information, and he wrote the press release. Anyhow, Walter Hott wrote the press release. Um, but later on, they started talking about having seen the bodies in the craft. I found a witness before Hot even mentioned that named Harris, who'd worked with um, Saunders. And Harris was telling me about how Walter Hot asked him one day, they were in the hangar where the stuff was stored before it was sent off to, to Wright Field. And he asked, uh, Hot asked Harris, do you want to see the bodies? And he said, just opened that door. And Harris said he put his hand on the door and he, he just didn't want to do it. He didn't want to see him. Hmm. But, he, but, but Harris told me this Why would story you not want to see that? I'm, I'm curious. I, I, I'm thinking it. they're talking about bodies. Okay. And I'm thinking that he just doesn't want to see a body. Gotcha. I, 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 I can understand. I would have been through the door in a second. Yeah. 
uh, but but yeah, uh, I mean, these guys were all World War II vets. Yeah, I got gotcha. you. Have to wonder what they may have seen. Um, you know, I I I have never seen a Vietnam movie, with the exception of the Green Berets. And the only reason I've seen that one all the way through is because we had a copy of Vietnam, <laughs> hmm. and and so we were pointing and laughing at it. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I, I I just don't want to see a Vietnam movie. Doesn't mm-hmm. mean I, World War II movies not a problem. Just don't want to see a Vietnam movie, and it just that's just something for me. So that might explain it. But anyhow, the point simply is, Harris told me that story like five years before Walter Hott said anything about seeing bodies, hmm. and I kind of discounted the story because Walter Hott said no, I never seen anything. And then he began telling the story about seeing the bodies. This is but all the rumor. Outlined. Not not to interject. The rumor was that they were alien bodies. Was yes. was the story? Yes. Okay. Yeah, yes, yes, uh, yes, gotcha. yes. Uh, but but the point but the point really is, um, you know, it, this is all laid out in Roswell in the twenty first century. So if you want to see the details, and you're really interested in it, you can go to Amazon.com and download the Kindle version like now, yeah. <laughs> and look all that stuff up. And if you do that, there is in fact a index not available on Kin- uh, in the book, but I do have a uh, index on my blog. So you can, you, there is an index available because when I put the book together, as you know, we now do everything through um, email and whatnot. Yeah. And the page numbers aren't going to match the printed pages numbers. And when the book was printed, I didn't have the page numbers to do the index before the book was printed. So I did it on my blog saying, if you know, if you need an index, it's on the blog and you can use it. You can. I think it's like 13 pages you can download it or uh, uh, print it out or whatever. For for those, let me interject, Kevin, for those that are watching uh, either live or the recorded on YouTube, you'll see Kevin's blog website on your screen. If you're listening, it is www.kevinrandall.blogspot.com. It's a great resource to check out. And, and I'm not just saying this to, to plug his books, but I do highly recommend his books simply because of, as you can tell, the detail that he goes into and uh, obviously uh, gives a big part of this story. So let me ask you a couple other questions, uh, Kevin, unrelated to Roswell. I do have one from the chat room, and this will be the last one on on, on Roswell, at least uh, for, for now, because I want to get into a couple other things. Stephen Padilla was asking about the Ramey memo. And obviously the analysis of the Ramey memo of, you know, getting in tight and and analyzing the text. Let me ask you, I mean, have you done any work with that? And is there any update on what we can or can't see? Because obviously, in my personal opinion, television has largely embellished that, but I could be wrong. So let me ask you, what's going on with that? I have actually been to the special collections at the University of Texas at Arlington where the photograph is held, the negative is held, and I've actually held the negative in my hot little hand. Actually, we had gloves on, so it wasn't, it wasn't in my hot little hand. Um, there have been high quality scans made over the years, uh, the highest quality available. The people in uh, Fort Worth at the University of Texas at Arlington, the people in Arlington, very helpful. Um, trying to get it on. David Rudiak's done a lot of work on that, and I always kind of bow to David Rudiak on that because of the quality of the work that he's done. We're at the point where David is convinced the, the critical line that says victims of the wreck. I can see that, but it's the, the, the document itself is held at just kind of the wrong angle, and the photographer was just maybe a foot too far away, and we just can't quite resolve it. Uh, another analysis done from those high quality scans says it says the viewing of the wreck changes the meaning completely. There are other parts of the memo you can read without with a magnifying glass and an eight by ten blow up of the photograph, but um, we just can't make it out. I can see it both ways depending on the mood I'm in or, or the time of day. I guess I can see victims of the wreck. I can see viewing of the wreck. Um, David has done a lot of work since. He was down in uh, Fort Worth on it. A guy named Martin Dwyer in New Zealand has been kind of ramrodding a project to see what he can learn. He's brought in some high-quality people, and at this point, we just can't quite make it out. But additional work is being done, and there's more information. We're hoping that more information will come out. I'm afraid we're just at the limits of what even the best technology is going to be able to do. I think the problem is we're dealing with with a photograph, a negative that is now more than 70 years old, mm-hmm. we're dealing with a negative 
that um, has been handled a lot since during those 70 years and uh, it's faded slightly and we may just not be able to resolve the issue. The Ramey memo, the other problem with the Ramey memo is J. Bon Johnson, who's a guy who took it, said originally he'd brought a document into Ramey's office with him, a teletype, and handed it to the general. When he discovered that that was going to um, negate some of the importance of that photograph, he said, no, no, it was a document that he'd picked up off Ramey's desk and handled to him. That was a classified document. Um, so Johnson's had it both ways. I see nothing that, in what we can read in the document that suggests it's a military document. I have been in meetings where the jargon has flowed so fast and furious that it's like people are speaking a foreign language. Mm -hmm. I've been in other meetings where you rarely hear any jargon. I mean, military meetings. Mm -hmm. There's no jargon in this thing. Um, in the military teletypes at the time, they didn't, use, they didn't have punctuation. It would say PD at the end of the sentence for period or CMA for a comma. So they, they typed out the abbreviations for the punctuation. There's none of that in the Ramey memo, which is not to say that it couldn't have come through because there are a few documents out there where, it's, where you have punctuation. And it may be that it wasn't the message that was pulled off the teletype, but it mm -hmm. was retyped general so that would change the complexion of the whole thing but there's but i find no jargon in it i'm hoping to be that we, at some point we're going to resolve this but right now the ramey memo is just just too nebulous for us to quite get to i appreciate that answer a quick shout out to sid vich for your uh support on the channel obviously anything through super chat goes to support interviews just like this so i really do appreciate that sid vich for that um, so, Kevin, just to kind of button the Roswell uh, story, and then I'll ask you about something else. It sounds like with the Ramey memo, with the Roswell as a whole, you're kind of on the fence. You haven't dismissed the potential of an extraterrestrial craft. You just need more. Or where 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 do you sit? I don't want to I lean, speak for I you. Lean, I lean to it being extraterrestrial. I'll say that. I, I lean toward it to be. But when I'm looking at it dispassionately, as James Van Allen told me to do, Yes, I'm dropping a name there, James, that, this, that guy, the mm -hmm. radiation belt guy, uh, he taught at the University of Iowa. I took astronomy at the University of Iowa, a, couple, a, a, a single course, I should say. And Van Allen, of course, was the chairman of the department. So at the University of Iowa, they were not the Van Allen belts, they were the radiation belts. The Van Allen belt holds up his pants, that's what he would tell people. Hmm. Anyway, the point is, uh, um, what his advice to me was, there were two pieces of advice, one of them pretty funny, was to look at it as dispassionately as you possibly can. So when I did Roswell in the 21st century, I looked at it dispassionately. Take, try to take my own personal bias out of it and write the book, this is where the evidence takes us today. Um, you can decide for yourself whether it is sufficient for you to be convinced it's alien or if it's just not quite, the evidence isn't quite there. The other thing he said to me was that if you're in the middle of Wyoming and you hear the thunder of hooves, you don't expect zebra. And I laugh about that now because not oh, several years ago, I read a story online about a, a breakout from a zoo or something like that, and a couple of zebra got loose in Wyoming. Hmm. So you could actually have been in Wyoming and heard the thunder of hooves, and it would have been zebra. Yeah. <laughs> which I always thought was kind of hilarious. The coincidence of he picked Wyoming and zebra, and by God, they were running loose in Wyoming at one point. <laughs> That's funny. Well, let me let me move on from that and ask you just in your decades of research, uh, other than Roswell, what is a case that sticks out to you where you either lean towards it being uh, extraterrestrially connected or you're convinced? I, I don't know if you are convinced of that on any case, but what sticks out to you as, as one of your one of your favorites? Level land, obviously. And give um, everybody and kind of a quick synopsis I of that. I, I, I gave you an opportunity to ask a question, John, so it looked like you were participating oh. in the conversation. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> no, I try no. and stay quiet. Nobody nobody wants to hear me talk anyway. So, no, you take it. Except me, of course. Yeah. Uh, no, Level Land took place in November of 1957. Number of people, people I've identified people at 13 separate locations, um, saw a glowing red object, landed close to them, took off stalled their car engines, filled the radios with static, uh, uh, dimmed their headlights. And when it took off, then the car would operate properly and the LED headlights came back on and all of that stuff. People at 13 separate locations. 
Uh, what happened in the case was the Air Force and Don Kehoe from the National Investigations Committee on Aerial Phenomena, which was a civilian research organization, got into a big, I was going to say a, a bad word, contest. <laughs> you can think what I was going to say there uh, about the number of witnesses. They said, well, Don Kehoe says there were nine witnesses who saw this thing. We could only find three. Looking at the Air Force file, I could find people at 13 locations. Hmm. So both of them were wrong, but it devolved into that kind of an argument. But if you'd looked at it, you've got these people independently calling the sheriff or the level and police on the night of November 2nd, uh, late toward midnight and in the morning of November 3rd, calling the, air, the, the, the sheriff's department, calling the police independently, describing basically the same thing, a egg-shaped object or torpedo-shaped object, depending on the angle you saw it at. Sheriff goes out to look for it, um, and he and it was reported for many, many years that, well, he just saw a streak of red in the distance. He didn't get close enough. Found a newspaper article where they interviewed the sheriff like two days later. He got much closer and described the shape. So the Air Force had actually said, you know, don't tell people what you saw. You know, keep it to yourself. Family members interviewed later, Don Burleson, who you may or may not know, mm -hmm. interviewed... Um, the widow and daughter of Sheriff, uh, Sheriff, um, Sheriff, Sheriff, Sheriff um, Weir, Sheriff Weir. I think it's Weir. <laughs> anyway, uh, interviewed the sheriff. Well, I don't know how you keep Clint. all the names straight. I'll be honest with you. There's, there's, I, I way, there's way too many. Well, this one is, it's either Clem Weir or Weir Clem. I'm not sure <laughs> the, the order. I get confused on his name. But uh, he went out there with a deputy. There was other other police officials that went out. There was a fire marshal that went out and saw saw things in the distance. But his, uh, uh, the sheriff's daughter and wife said, told Don Burlinson later that um, he got much closer. Mm -hmm. I verified that through the newspaper, so that that's true. Uh, the daughter said that there was a landing trace on a, a ranch north of Level Land that they went out to, a burned area in the field. And of course, everybody just ignored that because here is indirect physical evidence of a mm -hmm. landing. Um, didn't find it in any of the other areas. And nobody, and nobody ever mentioned this in any of the, dis the writings about Level Land until after Don Burlinson, after 2000, I think it was, got that information. And it was, it was like five years later, I found the newspaper article looking for something else. And I blundered, blundered across this newspaper article and saw that the sheriff was quoted as saying that he got much closer and it had a definite oval, oval shape to it. So had we not had the argument between NICAP and the Air Force arguing about who saw what mm -hmm. and a news media that uh, not treating the subject seriously at this point, mm -hmm. you know, they were they were always making fun of it. Today's environment's a little bit different. You get some very interesting reports in the newspapers where they take it take the information credibly. So the, the, that sort of changed. Sometime. But in nineteen, yeah, I, I, I qualify that. <laughs> But but in that time frame, it was, you know, uh, and were there pink elephants involved? Mm -hmm. uh, what we had been drinking type thing. Um, but but so Level Land is a very good case because of the number of witnesses independently reporting basically the same thing and with electromagnetic effects. One of the things I noticed is uh, the Condon Committee blew off the um, Level Land sighting. Some woman had claimed that her car had been stalled by a UFO some months earlier and they managed to man magnetically map the car and then compared it to other cars built at the same time in the same factory and couldn't find any magnetic deviations there except for one so they said well you know her story doesn't make sense and level land uh, we didn't look into because it was too long ago and we can know we know of no mechanism in which you could stall a car engine with an electromagnetic field and then when you remove that field the car would restart spontaneously so I started looking at all the cases of of um, vehicle interference where car was stalled and realized something that the way a lot of the stories were written it said the car began operating properly but in level land there's one or two pe people who said that when he tried to start the car it started properly so I begin to think that maybe when they said well the car began operating pro properly they took an action to start the car so it didn't spontaneous restart it was just when the the field whatever it was that mm -hmm. suppressed the engine um, when it was removed, then they could start their car. And I went through uh, Mark Rodiker's big um, compendium of all these 
cases of electromagnetic effects and found very few where it was suggested the car started spontaneously. It always seemed that, you know, when the car began to work properly or something like that, that suggested the possibility of the witness um, taking the action to start the car. So that negates the content content committee's a rejection of the Leveland case, but the other side of the coin, they didn't even bother to look at these cases carefully. They just sort of rejected them out of out of hand, which was their mission, of course, yeah. based on what we know. But Leveland, I always thought was very good. I think um, Rendlesham Forest is very interesting, especially because we have a lot of evidence that was created at the time of the event. Mm -hmm. We've, I've been able to interview, and I'm sure you've done the same thing. I've interviewed John Burroughs. I've talked to Jim Penniston. I've talked to Charles Halt. Mm -hmm. I've seen the documentation. I've talked to a couple other people whose names I won't mention because they're absolutely useless as witnesses. Uh, and I'm sure you know who I mean. Yeah. There is a lot of, you know, there's dry, it just seems like there's a lot of drama. Pick a case, there's a lot of drama that goes along with it. Yeah. yeah Rendlesham but, Forest included. But yeah, I'm. Yeah. I'm always fascinated a, by that. That's a different show in itself, but but just yeah, that, and, that drama, which sadly does follow a lot of these cases, but it's interesting to me. And and, and so that's a very good case as well, where they the thing approached the um, weapon storage facility at mm -hmm. uh, Bentwaters, Bentwaters, and that landed in the Rendlesham Forest. I think Bros got close to it, Pendleton Pend Pend got close to it, yeah. um, Halt got very close to it, and but Halt. The problem I had when I talked to Halt the last time. I got confused about the number of days that Burroughs was involved uh, because he talked about being there with, with Penniston, but it seemed like he was there on one day. And then uh, talking to Halt, he said that Burroughs wasn't there. And Burroughs, but I had an interview, I, I had heard an interview where um, Halt said that uh, this one witness couldn't have been in front of him, Halt, because the only people in front of Halt were Burroughs and another guy. Hmm. So, uh, and, and talking to him, it was like Burroughs was there on, on, on two nights. And there was a third night in the middle where um, things happened that freaked out the, um, the officer involved. Mm -hmm. And she was, she was transferred off the base soon after that. And I, I don't know what happened to her military career. But, but at least in talking with Halt and some of these people, I was able to clear out the number of days and who was where on what days and that sort of thing. So you've got a very interesting case there that um, left... Um, landing traces mm -hmm. um, and uh, had some radar tracked and may have had some Russian involvement as well. And I think that may have been coincidental as opposed to part of the, the whole Rendlesham thing. But Burroughs told me that there had been events prior to and after the three day events in uh, December of 1980, there were some other things that had gone on that uh, just don't get much in the way of reporting in the case. Yeah, but That's a very good case too. In the, in the last five minutes that I have you, Kevin, I, I want to ask you, just because you have spent so much time in this field and you've researched many different aspects of it, you seem, um, because I've known you for so long, I can comfortably say, uh, but just from this interview, obviously you pay attention to detail and you dig, and I, and I highly respect that. Where do you believe we are today with this? I mean, do you think, as some people do out there, that we are just on the cusp of disclosure with a capital D and the government's about to come clean? Where do you think we are with UFOs, with ufology here in 2020? Well, when we had the information that came out from the Tic Tac sighting, the Navy sightings of the object and the video tape showed up, it looked like the closure was getting closer. But now we've retreated from that. And I fear that it's not going to happen. But I'm, I'm working on a book now called uh, UFOs in the Dark State and, um, and issues with Air Force OSI and how some of the information has been suppressed and how some of the witnesses have been treated that suggests that there's, that there's a real effort to prohibit disclosure for reasons I don't understand. I don't understand why we would fear to disclose it in 2020. I can understand it in 1947, especially when you don't have a lot of answers. We have more answers and we've had uh, uh, an opportunity to process the information. I mean, if you just bring on somebody in 1947, you know there's uh, beings on other planets and they're here. That's gonna be kind of traumatic. But if you spring that today, a lot of people are gonna say, yeah, so what else is new? Um, you know, you, you go back to 47, uh, what's 72 years ago, 73 years ago, I had 72 for Roswell. We haven't got to July yet. Um, the aliens haven't really affected our lives. 
you know, the cure for cancer hasn't shown up. They haven't given us the machine that will allow free energy forever. Mm-hmm. That would collapse part of the economy. They haven't invaded, which would be absolutely mm-hmm. stupid. There's a science fiction move. It's great. But in real life, why would you bother to come to Earth when you can get everything you need out in the outreaches of the solar system? Uh, but but I don't think disclosure would be the traumatic event because we'd say, well, it's been 70, 70 odd years and nothing has happened. It hasn't affected my life. So yeah, if they want to show up, that's great. Um, more, more power to them. Uh, but they haven't really interacted with us. Uh, and I, I discount an awful lot of the abduction phenomena and things like that. But there have been points where they've sort of interacted with people, but they haven't really um, done anything threatening. So I, I just don't understand why, why, but I just, I do not see in the last year after the disclosure with the Tic Tac and the Navy being involved and um, the a- Academy to the Stars uh, stuff, it looked like we were moving closer to disclosure, but now I think we've taken a couple of steps back. I want to ask you about that. Quick uh, thank you to Sean Young and Renee Cruz for that support. I really do appreciate that. Why do you think that is, Kevin? Why do you think that step back is is going on? I mean, what, what happened to that momentum? Uh, if there was momentum in 2017 and arguably into 2018, what what, what went wrong? Uh, the world situation changed. Uh, other things have taken precedence. Um, uh, the president has gone um, to great lengths to engage people around the world in uh, trade agreements and things like that. And I think that may have taken precedence. So some of the push for it has evaporated. Um, other things have taken precedent for it. And and remember, the president said that um, he didn't believe that stuff when he was shown the, the yeah. videos. Um, unlike, unlike Bill Clinton, who apparently believed, um, I know um, Jimmy Carter believed, um, and I, I had an interview with Dan Sheehan not that long ago, just a couple of weeks ago, uh, for the book about his interaction with Jimmy Carter or their attempts to free that information up. And uh, the question I posed to Sheehan, and he didn't have an answer, neither do I, is Carter initiated the press, the, the push, to disclose the information about UFOs prior to being inaugurated. I mean, he was that interested in it. Yeah. Then something happened. And he left office without doing it. And I don't know what he would have seen or what he might have known or what caused him to kind of retreat from that point of view. I don't want to take you too much longer over my my ask of time <laughs> from you, but let me just squeeze in one last question. Because I am a firm believer, I've talked about it before on this program, that U.S. presidents, despite their interest, desire, motivation, whatever it may be, that a sitting U.S. president would not be read in to uh, secrets of this level, that I believe plausible deniability would take over and presidents are too much in the spotlight. They can screw up. Um, <clears throat> I won't name presidential names, but they could tweet about it because they love to tweet about everything else. So I think that the the spotlight from an intelligence standpoint would keep them from being read in despite their interest. Uh, do you disagree with that? Which is fine. I'm just curious. Uh, do you think that, that well, they would I, know the answers? If I'm the president and I want an answer to a question and I say to you, and you're the man guarding the question, you have the secret clearances, you have the information. I say, John Greenwald, tell me about UFOs. And you say, I'm sorry, Mr. President, you have the need to know. Mr. Greenwald, you're fired. Bring your deputy in. Mm-hmm. And I would ask the question of the deputy. And if you say, well, Mr. President, you have the need to know, don't have the need to know, you're fired. Bring in the next. Mm-hmm. And I would go down the list till I found the person who would read me in on that stuff. I know, I know, and I, and I, hate, to, I hate to bring this up because I'm giving something away that would be better, better left in the book. But Jimmy Carter was told that by George Bush. George Bush being the director of central intelligence mm-hmm. when, when Carter was elected president. Conversation took place prior to the inauguration, and Bush knew that he was not going to be held on as the director of the Central Intelligence. So he could say and get away with it, Mr. President, you have the, you're not the president yet. You don't have the need to know. I'm not going to tell you. He could get away with it. What, what's, what's Carter going to do? Fire him? He's already told him he's losing his job when he's inaugurated. Yeah. And so once, once Carter becomes the president, then he can say to 
his man, and that was why Bush lost the job. He, Carter wanted to bring his man in. He says to his man, I want to know. And I think that I think at that point, the, the guy would have told him. Or they tell him enough that they can they can now fall back on pl- plausible deniability. I, uh, I would only jump, I, jump in and play devil's advocate and say that's given the assumption that they would tell a sitting United States president you don't have a need to know. Where rather those that, again, I'm, I'm being a little conspiratorial here, but the secret keeper, so to speak, would say lie. Just lie to the sitting president yeah. and say oh, there's yeah. nothing there because Absolutely. that secrecy is timeless where a but sitting the, president is four or eight years. And so lie because then they'll go out and they'll go on Jimmy Kimmel and say, yeah, I asked. They told me nothing. And then everybody gets a big laugh when Jimmy Kimmel makes a joke and that's it. And I think that if there truly is this major cover up and conspiracy, which I do lean towards, that would be the way to handle it. I would think. Oh, absolutely. I General Exxon, who was involved in this early on, uh, told us, it gave us a name of a number of people who were on the oversight committee, not, not this MG12 nonsense, but an oversight committee, gave us the names. And he said, there are no elected officials on it. But he gave us the name Stuart Symington. And I only knew Stuart Symington as the senator from Missouri. But when I looked up his history in 1947, Stuart Symington was the... Um, the first civilian you encountered in the Air Force um, hierarchy, the first civilian in the Pentagon that you'd run to once you got out of the chief of staff, he reported to the secretary of the Air Force. George Symington at the time was secretary of the Air Force. So he would have been in on the secret, but he didn't, he didn't say anything. I think with Carter, um, well, they may well have lied to him, but I think that um, he just never brought it up again. And that, I find that very puzzling. Uh, with, with Bill Clinton, I can see him being lied to um, because he was somewhat of a loose cannon. I mean, and, and as you mentioned, the president today is more than a loose cannon. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Tweets his butt off all the time. Stop tweeting, Mr. President, please. Stop. Yeah, if we could only uh, get that. <laughs> Love him or hate him, I think everybody's on the same page there. Yeah, yeah, stop tweeting. Uh, cancel tweet, right? Uh, cancel Twitter right now. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, but but uh, and there's something to be said, you know, that you, you can lie to him. But there's other ways for the president to find out if he's really if he really wants to know. And there may be something that's there that um, they can say, well, Mr. President, here's what we here. Here's something. And it's such a traumatic bit of information that at that point he says, that's enough. I don't need to know anymore. Yeah. Uh, Reagan was the same way, by the way. Reagan had a couple of UFO sightings and was going to find out, and, and, he was, and he was convinced the next war would be between us and some invading alien force. Uh, but uh, he never said anything else. Uh, George, George H.W. Bush, I mean, he probably, he had to know. Yeah. He was the director of central intelligence. He didn't talk, and he probably told his son. Um, Bill Clinton, um, he had his own problems. Yeah. And I, I think that might have inhibited him from learning learning that. I don't think Barack Obama cared. Uh, he had other issues to deal with. And uh, I think uh, the same thing with President Trump. He's got a lot of other issues to deal with, and he doesn't need to worry about flying sausage for crying out, especially since the event started 72 years ago and hasn't really yeah. affected what we do today. Well, only time will tell what will happen here in the next election and whether or not world situations change but kevin all i know is i could talk to you all day so i i uh <clears throat> despite that minor hiccup in the very beginning i am very very thankful that knock on wood we got through this with no technical issues uh but i do appreciate your patience again all joking aside uh, of last time the the debacle uh, hopefully that will never happen again so i do appreciate <laughs> you taking the time and taking the gamble to come back here onto the show making sure nothing else would go wrong so thank you uh and and obviously thank you all for listening and watching check kevin out online at www.kevinrandall.blogspot.com he has an amazing list of books going well over 120 now kevin name them all Okay, we started with uh, what was called the Scorpion Squad, and uh, uh, we moved on to Vietnam Ground Zero, which was a series of twenty-six books um, backwards had, in reverse chronological order. Oh, oh, well, then we go. Then we, I think we start with uh, Encounter in the Desert, which was about the Lonnie Zamora sighting. Wait, are they all listed? Are they all listed on your website? 
No, there's a list of some 80 or so. Uh, somebody, somebody had gone to the Library of Congress and could only find 25 books that I'd written on the Library of Congress and said that I was making up the number of books I'd written. And another guy wrote and I said, yeah, you just look at the first page, dummy. Look <laughs> at the number of pages. So I put a list a number of years ago of, of the books. They're, they're on the blog, uh, but I haven't updated it. So a lot of the later books aren't on there, but, but there's a links to some of the newer books at the side you can just click on it to Amazon or you can go to your bookstore and order it and uh, if you enjoy um, enjoy the books uh, put a put a um, review on uh, Amazon yes those are very very helpful by the way so I fully support Kevin with that if you pick up his book definitely leave that review yeah, and I, I find even the even the negative reviews are are helpful, but because uh, I look at those when I when I want to buy a book, I look at the negative reviews and the positive reviews and decide whether I want to buy the book. And, and and sometimes the negative reviews push me over the edge to buying the book. Yeah, so, uh, one of the criticisms of of, of Ros, Roswell in the twenty first century, the guy the guy's whole review was there's no such thing as aliens. This book is a load of crap. And I'm thinking you obviously didn't read it because if you'd read the book, you would have known what my conclusions were. Yeah, and you would such an ignorant statement and i actually made a comment there about that that they, this guy hadn't read the book yeah well that sadly happens quite a bit where people read the back cover and they think they know exactly what you're trying to say but yeah. anyway well i do recommend everybody listening and watching make sure you check out kevin's book again kevin randall.blogspot.com kevin thank you again so much i really do appreciate it good talking to you john we have to get together sometime absolutely and thank you all for listening and watching this is john greenwald jr signing off we'll see you next time